product provided by Nintendo. And as always, this series was funded by great viewers just like you over on Patreon. Check out the description or end of the video to learn how you can help make it even more amazing. Hey everyone, Gaijin and Goomba here. And so not that long ago, Nintendo sent us a review copy of their brand new game for the Switch, ARMS. You know, that new Nintendo Switch game that's basically a blend of Wii Sports Boxing and Mr. Fantastic? It's not gotten the immediate traction like fellow newcomer IP Splatoon did in 2014, but judging from all the fan art and forum posts about the game, I think it's got a lot of potential. But in the lineup of 10 unique fighters from around the world, there's one in particular that really stuck with me. The shinobi in training at Laosen Ninjutsu Academy, Ninjara. Well, that shouldn't be any real surprise for us, should it? Well, you say that, but what got me really curious about Ninjara is just how amazingly loyal his design is to real-life ninja. Wait, what? Where'd you get that from? I mean, granted, he does wear a lot of navy blue, which actual ninjas wore during midnight missions, but really? The lime green highlights of both clothing and hair? He's about as effective at blending into his surroundings as Genji. Don't let the simplicities of appearance fool you. There's far, far more to character design than how the character looks. Wait, you mean Ninjara's abilities? Well, yeah, in a way. Both of Ninjara's abilities, the guard teleport and the mid-air dash teleport, have him blinking in and out of existence in a puff of smoke. In real-world application, this technique is known as the Noroshi no Jutsu, or light smoke technique. Commonly seen in media as ninja tossing around bombs and disappearing in the smoke, the technique is a little more elaborate than that. While it was very possible for the shinobi to drop a small smoke bomb and escape, igniting it would have proven tricky. Instead, oftentimes ninja would set up and ignite individual sources of smoke ahead of time to mask their movement while they were infiltrating instead of using it as an escape method. So while Ninjara borrows more of the perversion of the Noroshi no Jutsu, it's still an interesting nod. But that's not the only way Ninjara could teleport. There's another technique called the Migawari no Jutsu, or Kawarimi no Jutsu for you Naruto fans out there. Literally meaning substitution technique, in media, if the shinobi was hit by a weapon, they would essentially disappear and a random item like a log would take its place. In reality, the technique had multiple executions. For one, and this is probably where the whole log theme came from, Ninja could easily make decoys made out of wood or straw and strategically place them around exit points to fool the pursuers into thinking the dummy was the real thing. Another teleportation trick would be the Bushin no Jutsu, where the ninja would move so fast that under low light visibility and other compounded visual distractions, they would appear to be instantly moving to different locations. Very true, but honestly that's not what I mean when I refer to Ninja's design. I'm talking about those arms. Well, yeah, they're chains, but what's so special about that? Dude, everything! I firstly need to point out that everything that Ninja is is seemingly more related to chains than everyday ninja stereotypes. I mean, sure, he's fashioned his hair in a four-pronged shuriken, but not only his arms, but mask are completely wrapped up in that whole chain motif. Not to mention his name, Ninjara, comes from the Japanese root word jara jara, which is an onomatopoeia for jingling or rattling chains. And it's here I discovered that Ninjara is literally a living ninja weapon. Wait, how does that make any sense? His default weapons, the Chakram, isn't even a Japanese weapon. The Chaka, as it's originally called, actually comes from India's Sikh warriors, Granted, just like their use in arms, which has them spinning rapidly on a small extension before thrown, in ancient times the Chaka would be spun from the finger to gain momentum before thrown in an adversary. So props to arms for historically portraying the Chakram well, but I fail to see how Ninjara is a ninja weapon instead of an Indian one. Well, to be fair, Ninja did use Shaken, or literally wheel blades which come in a variety of shapes and sizes, including bladed rings just like the Chakram. But I'm referring to the multitude of other weapons that Ninja use that utilize chains. Seriously, in my many trips to the various museums and displays in Japan, I actually discovered that the armory of the shinobi were far more rooted in chain weaponry than any other type. There's the Kusarigama, which we covered last episode, but for those of you that missed it, the Kusarigama, literally meaning chain and sickle, is a hybridization of farm tools that gave the ninja a huge edge when it came to combating katana-armed warriors. The weighted chain allowed the user to either smack around their target at a distance or tie them up in the chain which allowed for an easy final blow with the sickle. I mean, geez, you can actually see one of the statues in Ninjara's stage using it. But that's the more recognizable weapon. There are tons of other ninja chain weapons. Like what? Well, there's also the Chigiriki, a long wooden or metal staff attached to a chain at the top with a heavy weight attached to it. Think of it as one part flail and one part bow staff, a long-range weapon that had some serious power. 
but what made it attractive to the shinobi is that the chain could easily be stored within the pole itself, making the weapon resemble a harmless walking stick, or if they were feeling extra tricky, a Buddhist monk's staff. Then there's the Kyoketsu Shoge. Well, that's a pretty bizarre name. Maybe, but man, this thing was efficient. The weapon itself was a double-bladed dagger that had a wide bent blade which was attached to 15 feet of rope, chain, or even hair, which ended in a heavy metal ring. And again, this was another amalgamation of farming tools, yet another example of ninjas being incredibly creative with their tools of trade. As far as its use, like the Kusarigama, the Kyoketsu Shoge had a multitude of uses. For one, that long double-bladed dagger would make for a very powerful weapon not just for stabbing, but hooking and disarming opponents who also used bladed weapons. The chain and ring, on the other hand, could do so much more. Outside of combat, the ring could easily snag onto tree branches or building outcroppings to make for easy climbing, but it could also be used not only as a massive way to slam your opponent with, but could be utilized in a variety of ways of ensnaring your opponent's hands and feet, rendering them completely helpless. Think of it as ultimate ring toss. If you win, you live. If you lose, you die. Wait, a long chain with a ring at the end used for snagging and striking opponents? That's pretty much one-to-one -one with Ninjara. See, for a while, that's what I thought too, but there's one more weapon that we haven't gone over yet that pretty much has convinced me of Ninjara's origin. The Kusari Fundo, also known as the Mandiki Gusari, or Great Power Chain. This was a beast of a concealed weapon. The chain could be anywhere from 1 to 4 feet in length with double weights on both ends, easy to conceal around one's arm, and made to look like a simple farmer's tool. But the outright insane and confusing techniques the shinobi could use when fighting with the Kusari Fundo were mesmerizing. As a dual-wielded weapon, it was nearly impossible to tell where the chain was going and which of its two weights would smack you right in the face. Well, that's cool and all, but why does this particular weapon bear such a resemblance to Ninjara? Well, the Kusari Fundo was not a uniform weapon. In fact, I would go so far to say that no Kusari Fundo were the same. The weights on their chains always varied depending on their user. Some Kusari Fundo had massive heavy weights on their chain, some had smaller weights. Some had pointed blades, while others were perfectly spherical. Some of them had longer weights and some had shorter weights. Again, it all depends on the user. And isn't that exactly what customization in ARMS is about? Oh, man, yeah. Each character has the ability to unlock and use every ARM weapon, big and small, light and heavy. And based on the individual preferences and styles of the player, Ninjara could be rolling out with everything from his standard double chakrams to the massive Megaton arms, the Pew Pew Dragon arms, the blinding blorbs, or even the hard-hitting whammers. Exactly. Just how Ninjara can use any of the 30 arms as his weapons, so too was the shinobi of real life able to graph any weight or blade of their choosing onto their Kusari Fundo. Which is why I say as far as Ninjara goes, he makes for a great ninja. Well, ninja weapon anyway, but you get the idea. Anyway guys, thanks for watching and a massive thank you to all my patrons who have given me the ability to create this show that I love so very much. And if you want to jump in and help keep the show alive, check out the show's ongoing growth over on Patreon. Because next episode, we're going to be talking about a subject that you, the patrons, voted on. And I can't wait to show you all the amazing things I've learned. Also, really fast, I need to announce that I am moving my weekly shinobi streams to twitch.tv forward slash gaijin goomba. Hope to see you all there. But regardless, thanks for watching, everyone. If you missed the first episodes of this series, fret not. You can check them out by clicking on the annotations on the screen or links in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to never miss out on my newest videos. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.